breaking down boundaries to understanding. We've heard about evolution quite a lot already this morning. And uh, surprisingly, though, uh, recent surveys show that acceptance of evolution around the world is actually declining. And for instance, in the US, about 60% of people actually don't think that evolution happens at all. Now, that's a serious problem for me because many of our most pressing uh, global problems rely on us understanding how evolution works. So things like loss of biodiversity, conservation, climate change, antibiotic resistance, medical technology, all of these things require legislators, managers, and those in power to understand how evolution works. Most people don't. And so that's what I'm trying to do today, is break down the boundaries and get help you to understand how evolution works, and in particular, how complexity can arise in the absence of any designing principle. Okay, so let's have the first thing again. Right, and we'll go here. Living things are really complex. We've got one nervous system, but we've got 100,000 million neurons, and they're all connected to each other a 1,000 times. That's what allows us to walk around here and do the stuff that we do. But when we look at a complex object, we tend to ascribe a designer. This is William Paley's watch and watchmaker hypothesis. You find a watch on the ground, you look at it, you say, oh, someone must have designed that watch. And therefore, there's a designer that generates this complexity. But the problem is, look at the hands that are designing this watch here. Those hands are more complex than the watch. So a complex object has to have a more complex designer. And a complex designer have to ha has to have an even more complex designer, and a more complex designer. And that argument runs on ad infinitum, and it becomes ridiculous. So, evolution provides a mechanism for explaining the complexity, but unfortunately, it occurs over really, really long time spans, and it's difficult to comprehend. So what I thought was, well, why don't I just find an analogy where you can actually see the changes happening, and it'll demonstrate what's going on. So changes to languages occur over a much shorter time frame than biological evolution, and you can use them to demonstrate these five points about evolution, natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, what, what are called punctuated equilibria, and lateral gene transfer. So let's get on with it. So here's mutation and natural selection for you. Now I'm going to pretend that I can speak Middle English here, okay? So, and if anyone's a scholar in here and I do it wrong, just please be quiet. Of studi took he must cure and must heeder, not a words back he more than was needer. And that was said in forma and reverence and short and quick and full of his sentenza. So in in moral virtue was his speecher, and gladly would he learner and gladly teacher. Now, that's English 600 years ago. Also, and gladly teach is the... Um, motto of Macquarie University, which is kind of why I put it in, and I'm going to get in really big trouble from, cor from corporate for using the old logo, but who cares? So there's, there's the modern parallel text, right, down the bottom there, and I think you can understand most of that, but it illustrates a whole bunch of things about evolution, all right? So ha no one has been in charge of changing the language over this time. It's just happened, and the language has got more complex. So let's have a look at what this is. In Chaucer, he and word was than that. All of those words have remained absolutely the same. They're the same as highly conserved genes, highly conserved functions that you can't muck around with. Because if you change he to hi or ho or who, it doesn't mean he anymore. All right? So changes, mutations in the pronunciation of those words are selected against. They're the equivalent of highly conserved genes. On the other side here, we've got study, must, said, mu, and noch. You know, you can still understand what they are, but those have changed in spelling and pronunciation over the last 600 years simply because more people spell, spelt them the way that they are spelt now. And, of course, there's extinction. There's that word soinja, uh, translated as pregnant in the um, transliteration. So we've got all of the things that happen in evolution. Mutation, replication, selection. The important observation is that no one has been designing these changes. What we've had is mutation to existing spellings and pronunciations, selection of those spellings and pronunciations, replication leading to modern English. 
Now, not all evolution is adaptive. Not all evolution actually leads to a consequence that's fit. And you can see this in the evolution of accents. So have a look at this bit out of Alexander Pope's essay on criticism. Uh, good nature and good sense must ever join. To err is human, to be forgive, devoin. Right? It must have been pronounced like that only in, you know, the mid to late 1600s. So English pronunciation exhibits this phenomenon of drift over time and the rate of change is dependent on how big the population occurs. So in genetics, the smaller the population, the more likely you are to get random genetic drift and fixation of weird, you know, hair colours and stuff like that. That's exactly what happens in pronunciation. So, how do languages then get more complex? And here's one of the ways. There's Frankenstein's monster there. Okay? We all know what Frankenstein's monster does. Frankenstein's monster evokes these images of the horrific, the technological, the synthetic, the artificial. And so that prefix, Franken, what it does, it, it, it means that to us. So we can make up new words really easily. Frankenfood, Frankenfish, Frankenscience, Frankenfruit, Frankenfries, Frankented. Okay? You know immediately what those mean without ever having he heard the word before. That's recombination between two separate ideas, generating complexity. No one actually, you know, there's, there's no one designing those. They just happen. They arise out of the corpus of English users, and if people like the word, they use it again, it replicates over and over again. Now, that kind of recombination that we're talking about here also generates variation in the genetic world as well. It's how our immune system works. You start with a number of uh, scaffolds, and it, you can have five of them, and you recombine them in different ways, and you end up with enough genetic diversity to recognize every single pathogen that is ever likely to exist in the universe. Recombination like that is the basis of lots of genetic diversity and lots of key um, characteristics of living things. Okay, another way that languages get more complex is by st simply stealing words from everywhere else. English is possibly the most adaptable and flexible of all of the languages that, w that are used on the planet. And the reason for that is because English steals words from everywhere. About 50% of our vocabulary has been taken from other languages. We don't actually realise that. So, you know, piano, volcano come from Italian, cartoon, dentist, routine, they come from French. Unless you look these words up in an etymological dictionary, you would not know that. English is adaptable and flexible because it's stolen all of these words from a bunch of other languages and incorporated, in, uh, incorporated them into its own vocabulary. Bacteria are like that too. Bacteria are adaptable and flexible because they're able to steal genes from other organisms. And that's the basis of antibiotic resistance. That's why so many bacteria become antibiotic resistant. They don't have to evolve antibiotic resistance themselves. They just steal the resistance gene from a bacterium that's already resistant. Incidentally, English, of course, is now um, sending its words back out into the world. And many English words are now being adopted by other languages, uh, kind of in a reverse transfer. In fact, the French tried to legislate against it. You know, le bleu jean, le coca-cola. Um, completely without success, I have to add. All right. So, then there's this thing called punctuated equilibrium. The idea here is... Oh, ah, I'm burning. <laughs> um, the idea here is that organisms remain the same over great periods of time. That's because the environment remains the same. And then suddenly in the fossil record, you'll see a transition to a whole bunch of new things, new organisms, new shapes, new populations, new abundances, new shapes of shells, all sorts of things. That's called punctuated equ equilibrium. In other words, an equilibrium, a steady state, punctuated by rapid change. And a lot of people, when they see this, 
think that, you know, there's the finger of the designer comes in and goes, well, we're going to push the button and make stuff happen. That's happened in English over the last 15 or so years. English has be been uniform over the last 100 or so years because we invented dictionaries where it tells you how to pronounce things, where it tells you how to spell things. Mass media, publications, all the kind of uh, spread of English language around the world has meant that English has become kind of static. That's an equilibrium. But that equilibrium has now been punctuated with a burst of evolution. And the cause of that is a change in the language environment. And that's being brought about by electronic messaging, by emails, by texts, by the need for fast and rapid communication via all of the kinds of connection means that we've been talking about already today. Have a look at this sentence here. And it's pretty certain that 15 years ago, none of you would have been able to say what that meant. But now it's really clear. Hi, mate, you okay? Sorry, I forgot to call you last night. Why don't we see a film tomorrow? Really, really simple. And yet, that would have just been completely unintelligible. There's an example of punctuated equilibrium where we've had this stasis and suddenly we've got a burst of innovation because the environment has changed, the language environment has changed. So similar bursts of evolution after long periods of stasis are also seen in the fossil record and as I mentioned before, this is called punctuated equilibrium. So, languages, have clearly become more complex over the last, well, I don't know, how long have we been speaking for? Probably 50, 100,000 years maybe, maybe longer. Because you know that the first languages were just a few sounds, a few grunts, a few words, a few nouns, you know, food, fire, water. And we've grown into a corpus of words and complex grammar and enormous creativity in um, language over that time. But there hasn't been anyone designing that. There's been no one in charge of where the language has gone to. What changes in language actually involve are incremental changes to meanings and spellings of existing words. And if those have utility, in other words, if people like them, They'll be used. In other words, they'll be replicated. Once they're replicated, more and more people will be using them. More and more people will replicate them. And it will be like biological evolution. In fact, many things progress in this way. Language works this way. Jokes works, work in this way. Computer viruses work in this way. And need I say, religions work in this way as well. The more people replicate something, the more they change. That's how complexity arises in the absence of design. Okay, so um, let me see if I can, well, you know, mm, I'm going to tell you a story about, um, uh, there used to be an add-on when I was a kid, and this will give away how old I was. Uh, so it's a little orange, and he's, he's rehearsing his lines, right? And, and the, the line is, um, Marinda makes me proud to be an orange. You know, it was an ad about, um, about, um, about a soft drink. And he's rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. Now the camera's come on, and he jumps on stage, and he says, Marinda makes me proud to be a orange. So I've always liked the word borange, and since I'm standing on a borange circle at the moment, um, I suggest that we make this a new word, borange, meaning a, me, meaning a slightly embarrassed Mandarin. Um, and, you know, if you like the word, feel free to use it, spread it around the world, Twitter it if you must, uh, put it on Facebook, whatever, uh, and you too can be part of increasing the complexity of English. Now. Let's go back to living things. Living things are obviously complex. Over here on the left-hand side, we've got some stromatolites. That's what the kind of first living things looked like, or the first, you know, complex living things, let's just say. Living things have been, become enormously more complex, incrementally 
by changes to genes, replication on those genes, and replication again and again and again, mutation, replication, mutation, replication. The reason why living things are so complex is that they've had a hell of a long time to do it. English language, last 600 years, has changed significantly. But living things have had 3.7 billion years to do that. 3.7 billion. Now, that number means very little to me. The way that I try and think about that is if you take an Olympic swimming pool and you fill it full of sand, count up the grains of sand, there's 100 million grains of sand in an Olympic swimming pool. So now imagine 37 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of sand, count all the grains of sand, that's how many years living things have had to reach their current level of complexity. And the processes that generate those com that complexity are exactly the same as those operating in languages or computer viruses or jokes or religions, mutation to existing entities, selection for advantageous changes, and then replication of organisms that carry those changes. And I'd argue that many of the critical issues that humans face over this century require us to understand how evolution works. Because the mountains are not going to change because of climate change. They're not going to disappear. Geographies, geologies, they're pretty stable over hundreds of millions of years. What we're actually concerned about on this little island that we call Earth is ourselves and the other organisms that we share it with. In order to understand the interactions between those organisms and what is going to happen over the next 50 to 100 years, which are a critical tipping point for human, human society and humans as a species, we need to understand evolution and how it works for understanding how climate change is going to affect the biosphere, for understanding how to deal with extinction, conservation, medical technology and emergence of antibiotic resistance. Thank you very much.